name is Timothy Stanley. I'm a lecturer in theology and religious studies here at the university. And we're going to talk through uh, a little bit about how we do this particular area of study at the university. Um, so I will do that for around 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then Scott, uh, who also teaches on the program, is going to talk to you guys about what you might more want to know, which is, so what are the programs we offer? What are the areas of study? What would it be like to do uh, one of the bachelor's or master's options? And then we have a partner institution called the Broken Bay Institute which Dan and uh, Lucy are going to just uh, speak a little bit to in terms of their own, um, why they study theology and religion, how is it that they got into this, and they teach on that program there, which primarily does master's and distance sort of education, that's one of their expertise. And we are going to talk forever, so you know, if you have questions and you want to sort of interrogate us a little bit, um, we'll leave some time for that uh, as well. And I've given you just a brief uh, kind of handout of what I'm going to talk through and the website is there if you want to follow up and get in touch with us that way. So it's a strange irony, I suppose, but we have quite a bit of mythology about what it is to do theology and religious studies at the university. Um, one of the myths is that uh, you have to be religious to study religion. So this is a place for sort of Bible thumping and slight, you know, proselytizing, but you need to be religious. You know, you have to be an insider to Judaism, to Christianity, or something like this. Or people often get asked if they study on the program, uh, are you going to be a priest? Are you going to be a nun or something like that? <laughs> so uh, one of the myths we have to sort of deconstruct a little bit is, um, no, not necessarily. You know, we do have people who do come here to study uh, uh, for various uh, uh, ordinations, but that's not the only thing. And this leads to the other myth, which is that um, theology at a university is where the atheists live. You know, this is where you come to lose your faith. This is for people who don't have any uh, particular uh, uh, religious affiliation, and you know we're sort of secretly out to destroy you know um, people who who believe any one thing. And this is equally not true. Okay, we we have many atheists in our philosophy department, and we have plenty of good arguments. Okay, but that's what we're trying to do here: is to foster conversation and to foster uh, the dialogue. Now, how do we do this? You know, how do we get people to come from a range of religious traditions? and a range of dispositions, you know, uh, philosophically, theologically, or otherwise, well, in a word, uh, through methods. We do this with uh, this strange, you know, you might think of this in terms of the sciences, but method actually comes from a Greek root, hados, which just means the way. So you think of walking through a forest, we have this sense, I think, you know, missing the forest from the trees, yes? So when you want to study and really understand a forest, you might need to think about the geography, okay? Uh, you throw maybe a Tolkien book, you know, Tolkien loves to draw the forest, Fangorn forest, and all the things, so you can kind of get a sense. Um, and geography is really, really important for studying religions, because religions spread, and they go to different continents, uh, different areas. Um, so there are more Christians worshiping in China today than there are in the Bible Belt in the U.S., which is rather peculiar, because you know, communist, atheist China, you know, this, this doesn't seem to match up. So geography is a way that you can study religion, and it's a way of approach, it's a way of kind of getting through this forest um, and making some sense of it. So whether you're an outsider or whether you are an insider, right, you can get some kind of objectivity on the manner of study. And this is the same thing we do with history. Okay, we want to look at the pasts and the way in which those pasts have connected with us today. You might think of history actually more like a genealogy. Have any of you become addicted to these, um, oh, what is it, you know, where you go and find your family online? Uh, yes, and so, I mean, I mean, these are dangerous because, you know, you get in and you find ship manifests and, you know, you're just, all of a sudden you found, you know, your great great ancestor from Germany or something. So, um, but it's more of a, you know, you're interested in your family, you're interested in your line. And history is very much helpful, you know, in the sense of we're trying to say, well, here we are today, but what were the steps that led us to where we got today? Um, and we look at texts. So how do you study a Bible in a university? Uh, Lucy might say something about this. She studies uh, Deuteronomistic history and texts. But here we have some odd words called exegesis and hermeneutics, which is sort of the techniques and, again, the methods for studying uh, ancient scripture, whether it's the Quran or uh, Hebrew scripture and Deuteronomy or the Christian scripture. And that might mean you have to learn a language, you know, a bit of Greek, uh, a bit of Hebrew, or something like that. But again, that's a particular approach in looking at texts. And here we come on to some of my own interests in social anthropology in terms of people. Uh, what brings people together? 
Why do they interact in the ways that they do? What are the stories they tell about themselves? Um, so sociologists like to talk about things like church as an institution of people and state as an institution of people. What's the relationship between church and state? Um, how do these things uh, go together over the history of, say, the West uh, in Europe? Uh, but many people, when they think of religion, they think of belief. Okay? And one of the most central questions, I think, in religious studies is, what makes a belief believable? What makes virgin birth believable for two billion Christians? You know? What makes uh, the Quran believable for two billion Muslims? Um, and we can answer that with geography and history and text, but we can also answer that philosophically. We can look at the logic of the interaction between beliefs and the way in which beliefs hold together for different dispositions. And in my own work, I was bringing together Martin Heidegger, an atheist philosopher, and Karl Barth, a dogmatic theologian, and trying to get them to talk to each other. Obviously, they're both dead, but they're in a book. You know, uh, my favorite people are dead. I don't know about you. You probably like living people, but scholars, you know, they're dead. They can't argue with you. It's sort of like a dog or something. You can. So you bring philosophers and theology, theologians together to answer this question, what makes a belief believable? And uh, again, you can see how then that wouldn't be exclusive to insiders necessarily or outsiders. A number of people can use these methods and not miss the forest for the trees. So I'll give you just an example of some of the courses that we teach. These are ones that I'm particularly involved with, but there's a range that uh, Scott may point out as well. So we'll do like a world religions course, which is just a big survey. This is a kind of one of our largest courses here, and lots of people from all over the university come because they just want the basics. You know, what what's, what uh, is Islam about? What is Judaism about? How does Christianity uh, fit into this mix? We talk about religious ethics. Uh, is God ethical? It's not an easy question to answer. Uh, does being religious make you more or less ethical? And you can see in our own civil society, people have very different answers to this. Um, I love this sort of picture. It's from an Altoids advertisement. Uh, Altoids, these sort of curiously strong mints. Um, but it's sort of you know, the Adam and Eve kind of you know, thing here. Uh, uh, which is a, it's interesting because it's a you know, company who's trying to sell you fruity mints, basically, that kind of are so fruity they blow your head off. But they've used a religious uh, uh, image religion shows up today. Church and state we teach, uh, which I've already mentioned. We talk about religion, ritual, and consciousness. So this is a course where we look at rituals uh, and social configurations, but we also look at psychological uh, uh, methods. So what does Freud say? What does William James say uh, about religion? And helping people think about uh, the kind of inner structure of uh, the mind and religion. Now one of my Problems. I don't know if I need to get help for this, but I basically read philosophy and I watch movies. And I find that whenever I'm teaching, I just immediately fall back to some kind of film, you know, Da Vinci Code, and I don't know, Mel Gibson's Passion, you know, Superman. There, there's, uh, I don't know, I watch too many movies. And I thought, why am I wasting my time just bringing this in alongside of other courses? Why don't I just teach a whole course on religion and film? So that's what we do, we do things like that. Which, you know, you can imagine, I think a lot of people will be interested in looking at vampires. Why are there so many vampires in the movies today? Um, and what is it with the Da Vinci Code? I was on a plane the other day, and, you know, there's this awkward thing. British people, I was in England. Do we have any Brits here? No? I need a friend. Okay, well, you'll know this, or maybe not, but there's sort of, you don't talk to each other until you've had a drink. So the drinks go around in the airplane, and then everybody kind of opens up. So you get this thing, so what do you do? And it's really awkward, you know, what do you do? I study religion and politics two things you don't talk about in polite conversation. <laughs> First question, though, the Da Vinci Code. You know, is it true? You know, uh, so, I mean, this is one of these things of, I was like, well, you know, the book was better than the movie, Tom Hanks, terrible actor. You know, but, uh, I mean, of course not. You know, I mean, there's, this is uh, fiction. It says on the cover. Uh, and yet it had a profound resonance and influence uh, in our culture. So we try to address some of these things in film. Uh, and lastly, it's about this new visibility of religion, which is, of course, what we that looks at how religion is showing up in all sorts of aspects of our culture. Um, why is it that we're asking our prime ministers to say what they believe? You know, before it was purely kind of private, and now we want to know, are you an atheist and why? Tony Abbott, okay, you know, what's, what's going on with your past faith? And of course we see this in the UK and the US as well. Um, and so we're trying to, again, use methods to look at this new visibility and try and make sense of what's going on in our culture. So when it comes to why studying religions, and this is really you know, one of the areas that I think people 
are really drawn to and, and what they immediately think of often is a kind of clash of civilizations, you know, violence, that religion leads to violence somehow. And uh, uh, in addressing kind of that new visibility and the way religion is showing up today, we certainly have to deal with this. The trouble is that uh, uh, religion is not a single faceted phenomenon. It's not just about violence. It's not just a fragmenting source in our society. It actually also brings people together in a variety of ways. And it's this Janus face, this kind of two-sided aspect to religion, uh, where we have to look at religion and violence and take it seriously. But even, you know, sort of Marxist atheists today, like uh, you're going to uh, have a you know, they're interested in Martin Luther King because there's no Martin Luther King movement without the Reverend Doctor. He needed churches to help him organize and bring people together to uh, instantiate that very careful kind of outmaneuvering of uh, his civil society and uh, the ways in which they negotiated civil disobedience to overcome the various race and uh, racism in the South. Um, so where we're coming from, I think, with religion and theology at this university is rather than trying to squelch it, you know, some, some universities uh, just keep it out of the university. We don't want to talk about it. Here, our idea is, is that the cure for religious violence may ultimately lie in a renewed appreciation for religion itself. That we can help people to develop discourse and grammar uh, to really dialogue and understand religion in their society today. Um, the fact is, if you're going to be a nurse or a doctor or a police officer or a teacher okay, or a pastor or a priest, you're going to come across people where religion is one of their primary means of identification. And your ability to understand that and interact with that in a uh, uh, kind of meaningful and you know, even a critical uh, way is going to be crucial for your success in civil society today. So that's kind of where we're coming from. That's sort of what it means, you know, more or less to study theology and religions in the university. That's some examples of the kinds of courses uh, that you could do. But now I want to turn it over to Scott to talk a little bit about the programs and the kinds of bigger picture, you know, administrative.